On behalf of the College of Forest Resources, I wish to welcome all of you to the ninth Denman Forest Reissues Series entitled Impacts of Invasive Species in the Pacific Northwest. We look forward to a very exciting and informative program today. The purpose of the Denman Forest Reissues Series is to provide information and discussion on timely forestry and natural resource issues. As with all the activities associated with an academic setting, our ultimate goal is to inform and educate our students, faculty and staff, as well as resource professionals, landowners, and the general public. These programs are made possible through the generous support provided by the Denman Endowment for Student Excellence in Forest Resources. And they support the college's vision of being a world-class and internationally recognized source of knowledge relevant to environmental and natural resource issues. The mission of the College of Forest Resources is to study and investigate the sustainability and functionality of complex natural resource and environmental systems in both natural and managed environments using an interdisciplinary approach across multiple spatial and temporal scales that include our urban, suburban, and wildland landscapes. In our college, we focus on programs in sustainable forestry, sustainable urban environments, and sustainable forest enterprises. Sustainability serves as the cornerstone of our programs and includes all resources, such as timber, plants, water, wildlife, or insects, considers the needs of future generations as well as those of the present, and strives for a dynamic equilibrium that balances ecological functions and conditions with social and economic factors. Recently, USDA Forest Service Chief Dale Bosworth identified four challenges or threats to the health of our national forest. And these include fire and fuels and the most appropriate way to manage them, the growing occurrence of invasive plants, animals, and diseases, the loss of open space to development, and the growing occurrence of unmanaged outdoor recreational activities. Today, we wish to focus on the second of these threats related to the impact of invasive species. It is estimated that economic damages and cost of control related to invasive species amount to about $138 billion per year throughout the country. Although this is a huge sum, this is not a new issue. Since European settlement, over 50,000 species of plants alone have been introduced into America. Some examples of well-known invasive species, some of which we'll hear about today, include among the plants, cheatgrass and knapweeds, kudzo, scotch broom, invasive spartina, yellow star thistle, and giant reed. Some well-known examples among animals include the European starling, Asian longhorn beetle, European gypsy moth, zebra mussel, and emerald ash borer. And some well-known examples among microbes include sudden oak death, West Nile virus, Dutch elm disease, and chestnut blight. While these alien plants may cause great damage, many greatly improve our landscapes and provide the majority of our crops. It is estimated that 5,000 of the 50,000 introduced plants have gone wild to compete with the 17,000 native species. How we manage this issue to assess the proper trade-off between excessive regulation and unbridled movement of plants and animals is crucial to the future success of invasive species control. To set the stage for our speakers today, we need to define the term invasive species. An invasive species is a species that is non-native or alien to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm to human health. An alternate definition is that an invasive species is a non-native species that can or has spread into natural or managed ecosystems, develop self-sustaining populations, and becomes dominant or disruptive to those systems. This graph illustrates the relative magnitude of invasive species as a partial or whole cause of threatened or endangered species listings in the U.S. 
the occurrence of invasive species is the second leading cause exceeded only by habitat destruction. The protection and restoration of our natural and managed ecosystems is essential to a sustainable environment. And managing the introduction of additional harmful invasive species and controlling those harmful species already present is a critical element to regaining the desired balance we all seek. With us today to address these issues are speakers from government agencies and higher education. Our topic, once again, is impacts of invasive species in the Pacific Northwest. I now will turn the program back to our moderator, Associate Dean, Dean Steve West. Thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> the first speaker is John Marsloff. John's a professor of wildlife science here in the College of Forest Resources. Received his PhD from Northern Arizona University. His research interests are in urban and forest wildlife ecology, particularly the study of crows, for which he's known by far the best, uh, and also the conservation of birds of prey. Uh, John's talk is entitled, When Habitat is Not Sufficient to Conserve Wildlife. John. Thanks, Steve. Many of you have probably heard the the term or maybe seen the bumper sticker that says that uh, habitat is the key to wildlife. And uh, oftentimes that works, but in our increasingly human dominated world, especially one where humans can travel back and forth across the globe with relative ease within a couple of days of travel time, uh, that no longer holds in many um, circumstances. And that's what I want to talk about today is when that doesn't hold. Uh, my bias, as Steve said, is, um, is bird centric and the examples I'll use are from birds and uh, work that my students and I have been conducting here. But I think the lessons, unfortunately, are um, also applicable to mammals and reptiles and amphibians as well. So the first point to make is just um, highlights uh, the general trend that uh, Bruce started with uh, to introduce the session this morning and also some of the points others have made and that is that exotics or invasives are becoming increasingly common. And this just shows a categorization of um, two kinds of communities, breeding bird uh, communities and freshwater fish communities. And it shows just the number of non-native and native species. Uh, for example, within fish in Europe, or let's say uh, California, where there are 42 non-native species of freshwater fish and only 76 native species uh, in, in the state. And this is an example uh, that shows the large extent to which um, exotic species can come to dominate um, systems. Freshwater fish in this case are um, quite commonly composed, uh, the systems there, of 20 to 50 percent uh, non-native species. And that's of course because we love to catch and eat a lot of those. So we plant them everywhere for our own enjoyment. Uh, breeding bird communities tend to be less dominated by uh, non-native species. Uh, somewhere around um, 2 to 10 percent, let's say, from these examples. And another thing that's shown in this case, if this arrow will come back, are that the um, island uh, settings, places like Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Cuba, the Bahamas, tend to have higher proportions of exotic species than do some of the mainland um, or continental faunas that have been looked at. And so I'll focus on some examples from islands uh, for you today because that's where, from the wildlife standpoint, some of these effects are the largest. Also to make the point that if you look at what causes the endangerment of wildlife species and plants in this case um, throughout the U.S. that interactions with non-native species top the list in terms of reasons why species in the United States have been listed on our Endangered Species Act. Just shows that there are 305 species whose one of the main causes for their listing as endangered or threatened was an interaction with non-native species. And that compares you know, three times basically the rate at which um, energy exploration or industrial uh, use of lands or military use of lands uh, seems to cause endangerment. Another important point is that land use changes facilitate a lot of these invasions. We've heard about a lot of the reasons um, why particular species might become invasive, but um, this is another more uh, large scale, landscape scale reason why species are able to invade areas. And it especially uh, may influence the ability of a species that is native in a particular area to travel throughout that area and have effects. So this is an example of um, one of the most, of course, important species, the crow, following the plow across the, the U.S. And what happened here was that crows basically had an amazing 
behavioral and cultural revolution to our agricultural revolution. As we change the habitat from mostly grassland, where crows didn't live, don't exist, it was mostly ravens there, we changed it to cornfields and wheat fields, which are great feeders for crows. Their numbers increased dramatically, and there the American crow, which was a species found primarily in the eastern U.S., spread west at that point, following the plow. And when it got to uh, Washington, and Oregon perhaps, and certainly British Columbia, and perhaps even up into Alaska, it may have done a, a particularly nasty thing. It certainly enriched our culture, nobody would argue that. But it may also have uh, extinguished the Northwestern crow. The genetics haven't been done on that yet, but the, um, the theory is that the abundance of the American crow has led to interbreeding with the more native race uh, which is a full species still, the Northwestern crow, and probably genetically swamped that species to extinction. So here's a species that can be invasive uh, because of our activities and uh, could lead to the extinction of another species. A well, similar story can be told about the barred owl. Um, and the, these guys, I must say, are a lot cuter than those sap-sucking adelgids that we heard about <laughs> <coughs> earlier. The barred owl is a native species its range was in the eastern U.S. for here, for most of the uh, uh, recent times. But in the last uh, 50 years or 100 years, it started to spread uh, west. And it followed this um, more northern track than the American crow did, but probably also in response to increased um, planting of hedgerows and other woodland habitats that this species needs. And perhaps other changes in the landscape, some of which could be natural, but some of which are likely human-caused. So this species has invaded from its native range and moved to the west, which, you know, wouldn't be a bad thing. This is kind of a neat owl. It's a nice increase in biodiversity, and it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cute species. But, unfortunately, it's a very nasty species as well. It, it is uh, extremely competitive and outcompetes our native spotted owl, which is shown down here, which is a congener of this species. Looks very similar. It's just a matter of stripes or spots, basically, on these two owls. But the barred owl is competitively superior. And it's uh, work that Scott Gremmel and others have been doing in, on the Olympic National Park has shown that the spotted owl has had to now use less, um, less productive habitat, that higher in elevation, uh, than it had formerly used. And the population has been, de been declining on the Olympic Peninsula, even in the protection, within the protection of the national park, at a rate of about 4 to 7 percent uh, per year. And that's not a, obviously not a sustainable rate. So it makes the point strongly that just providing the habitat, setting aside large reserves in some cases where exotic species or invading species can get to them, uh, may not be sufficient for the conservation of a species such as the, bar or such as the spotted owl. Um, it's certainly necessary, but it's not sufficient because these other uh, factors, which are basically habitat independent, can come in and limit a species such as the spotted owl. So let's take a trip a little further west, and that is uh, to the uh, Mariana Islands. This is the island of Rhoda, which is a small island in the uh, Mariana chain, northern Mariana chain. And it's, it looks great. I mean, it's a beautiful place. It's paradise, really. Uh, there's very little human settlement there. Uh, there's not a lot of land conversion. There's, there's a golf course in case you, you know, want to tee it up. But uh, it's not very developed. It looks like great habitat. And it's not bad habitat, but it is affected by uh, several exotic species. And the, the primary thing that these species do is limit, again, a very important cultural icon, the Mariana crow, which is otherwise known as the aga. And the aga is a native, uh, very unique crow species that lives on only two islands, the island of Guam and the island of Rhoda that I just showed you. And on Rhoda, the population has is been in decline, but not nearly as severely as it is on uh, Guam. Here's the track for the island of Rhoda. And the populations, this is probably some anomaly from our counting abilities, this population has generally declined to about four to 500 crows. It's all that exists there. And that's because uh, that island is in pretty good shape habitat-wise. There are some exotics there, such as the um, uh, exotic monitor lizards, there's some exotic rats, and there's the drongo, which is, a, again, a competitive bird, kind of like the barred owl for the spotted owl. That may have caused some of these declines. We don't fully understand them. But we do fully understand what happened on Guam. And on Guam, there were probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,500 uh, crows back in the uh, mid-1900s. Their population has declined to zero wild birds. There have been a few birds reintroduced now from 
Rota to Guam, but, but the natural population of Guam birds is extinct, despite it being listed, despite habitat being set aside for it. And the reason is this animal right here, not, not this guy, this one right here that he's holding. So this is a brown tree snake. And uh, the story of the brown tree snake and how it got to Guam also involves the military like we saw with some of these gypsy moths earlier. That is, the brown tree snake was a stowaway in uh, army cargo that was moved from the um, Australia region at the end of World War II and stored on Guam. Innocently enough, stored on Guam, but also stored with that cargo were these brown tree snakes. And they got out and they basically ate their way through the island. And they've uh, caused the um, endangerment and, and extinguished many of the native species, including the, the crow. Similar story in Hawaii. Hawaii is a fabulous place because it's isolated. There's been incredible um, evolution there of uh, genetic diversity and species diversity that we see here, represented with a bunch of the, um, the birds known as honey creepers or uh, drapanids. And over here, again, very important aspect of the Hawaiian avifauna is the Hawaiian crow, one of the, the rarest bird uh, in the world right now, I would, I would argue. Well, these animals have been ravaged by a variety of uh, introduced exotic species. Uh, there are a variety of birds that have been introduced there, but there are most importantly mosquitoes, which were innocently um, um, dumped into a stream on Maui in the 1800s by a Mexican sailor who was probably just getting some fresh water. He was really happy to see this freshwater stream, dumped his old water, took in some new common practice at that time, and that introduced mosquitoes. So there was a vector there for disease. Then malaria and pox were introduced later uh, as, in the pet bird trade or as people brought captive birds to have with them uh, in this new island home. And then rats followed on ships as well. So there are a variety of uh, exotic species that are invasive there and causing uh, detriments to the, to the native fauna. And in fact, it's decimated the fabulous creation that's occurred there of these honey creepers in particular. The ones with the uh, slashes through them are gone, extinct. The ones with the uh, little lightning bolts through them are down in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 individuals. These aren't like the spotted owl where there's thousands. These animals are basically uh, the living dead at this point. There's three of these species that are in anywhere normal shape. And that's because of these, um, this combination of rodents, malaria, pox, and, and other things like um, some of the weasels that have been introduced there as well. And some of the biggest concerns with losing species like this are the other effects that they have. And in this case, these are important pollinators for the Hawaiian uh, plants. Again, incredible diversity of plants there. And one of the primary pollinators now, the birds are being lost. The alala is well documented. This is the Hawaiian crow, well documented in its population decline. And basically from about a thousand individuals we figure that occurred on the island of Hawaii down to zero now in the wild, there's 35 uh, animals in captivity, but they can't be released because these limiting factors haven't been removed. The habitat's there. In fact, it's been reserved and purchased and fences have even been bought to put around it, but they cannot be released now still because rats and cats and toxoplasmosis and malaria and other limiting factors are still there. And I should mention pigs as well, very important uh, habitat modifier that were introduced about 1600 years ago by humans are facilitating a lot of this disease spread. Well, it goes on and on and, and now we're dealing with West Nile virus here in the continental US. It isn't in Hawaii yet, but there's concerns that it will be. West Nile was first discovered in 1937 uh, a woman was, um, had a high fever uh, from it in Uganda, and uh, it was thought to be a relatively uh, rare disease that didn't have a big effect on people. Uh, there were a lot of people that might get a fever, but they didn't die from it. But that changed in the 1990s when there were outbreaks in Romania and Russia and the U.S. where lots of people died, and there were then a lot of concern, obviously, about it. And the U.S outbreak which started in uh, 1999 also has a lot of bird deaths associated with it. So I want to talk about that just briefly with you. I must uh, just point out um, that it, it arrived uh, in New York City in 1999. Uh, it was brought there probably incidentally by either uh, an affected person or a bird but it really cruised through the United States incredibly rapidly. This map shows the first four years of its spread. The red uh, portion here shows where it uh, spread the first year in 1999. Then it got to the green states in 2000, got all the way to the Mississippi in 2001, and then all the way to Washington um, in a crow by uh, my home in uh, 2002. In 2003, it's been everywhere now except uh, Washington, Oregon. Oregon still is, has not 
uh, seen the disease at all. Washington, as I said, had it in 2002, but not in 2003. And we're not sure about this year. So the, the interesting thing about this virus is that it goes through a quite normal cycle here where mosquitoes pass this among some competent avian hosts, things like these exotic species, starlings and uh, house sparrows that um, Bruce mentioned earlier. And the problem is when it spins off to incidental hosts like us and kills us or birds. And it's, it's caused huge mortalities of wild birds and uh, has infected nearly 200 species at this point. Another thing we, we deal with with wildlife is actual change in habitat in, in response to exotic species. And here's some examples that show as subdivisions around Seattle become older. On the top panel, the proportion of the plant fauna, which is what is labeled on that y-axis, is uh, exotic increases. So older neighborhoods have higher proportions of exotic species and uh, neighborhoods that are more uh, interdigitated with um, native forest and the built environment. So they're less aggregated. They're more like this as opposed to built and unbuilt uh, areas. Those tend to have um, greater uh, development of exotic species, which then reduce the ability of some of our native birds, such as winter wrens, to exist in these areas. So let me end just by uh, putting this into an even a larger perspective for you. Um, we've seen a lot of different um, exotic and invasive species that uh, either change the system or cause the direct extinction and loss of biodiversity in an area. And uh, Peter Vitusik and his colleagues put this into a global perspective, perspective for us here with respect to mammals. And what they show is that the dots uh, on the line there show that as you add the continental land masses together and add up the number of species that occur on these land masses, uh, you see a linear relationship. This is actually a log plot. And uh, so as you get more of a land area, you get more species. If you were to add up all the land uh, in the world and, call, and think of it as a giant supercontinent, Pangaea like used to exist uh, before continents drifted apart, you'd expect somewhere around 2,000 mammals to be able to live on that combined land mass. In fact, we've got about 4,000. This puts into perspective then what we're doing. We have at risk the possibility of losing uh, about half of the mammals by increasing movement of invasive species and other limiting factors across the continents, basically reducing the isolation that these continents now have which is the reason why they're so diverse. That's why we've got twice as many species as we should from area alone. With that, I'll leave it to the next talk. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Our second speaker in the session is Miranda Wecker. Miranda currently directs and manages the marine program out at the uh, Olympic Natural Resource Center in Forks, Washington. Uh, she's a member of the Washington Bar Association and graduate of the UW School of Law. Uh, she has a Master's of Law and Marine Affairs degree. Uh, she's got 20, actually more than 20 years of experience uh, working with nonprofit organizations at virtually all levels of, of organization. Uh, she serves on the Pacific County Noxious Weed Control Board and the Willapa Bay Water Resources Coordinating Council. So, Miranda? Well, I'm, for one, very glad that we have this panel to, to bring attention to invasive species because it's about time. It's actually very late in the game to be talking about this very important environmental concern. I've worked on the problem that I'm about to present you information on for about 13 years now. And uh, this is going to be a story that I hope will give you some optimism and hope that with concerted effort, we might be able to defeat at least some of these invasions. Um, I won't have a chance to talk about a lot of the work that we've been doing at the Olympic Natural Resources Center to contribute to the fight to eradicate Spartina from Willapa Bay. Uh, such things as GIS mapping and modeling, spatial tide predictions, uh, public science, uh, uh, ed education conferences, and we've also be been doing quite a bit to support strategic planning. First, let me give you a little snapshot of Willapa Bay and its remarkable ecological and economic value. Situated just north of the Columbia River, Willapa is undoubtedly one of the last best estuaries left in the lower 48 states. Willapa accounts for two-thirds of the oysters produced in Washington state, and one in every four oysters produced in our country. 
Not one of Willapa's salmon stocks are either endangered or threatened. Willapa is one of the top 10 fueling stops on the Pacific Flyway for migratory birds. There's no large industries in Willapa Bay. And the surrounding watershed is home to fewer than 25,000 full-time residents. It's really quite remarkable, actually quite surprising, that a place like this still exists. And someday I hope you all can visit Willapa Bay. The mudflats of Willapa Bay before the Spartina invasion extended uninterrupted for about 50,000 acres. Willapa Bay's shallow depth offered inviting terrain to an intertidal grass from the U.S. East Coast called Spartina alterniflora. Here you see the leading edge of the Spartina meadow invading eelgrass beds in Willapa. Spartina's presence causes profound changes that disadvantage many native species, including eelgrass, that's so critical for our salmon stocks. This slide shows the growth pattern of Spartina as it invades. From a single seedling, its rhizomes spread in all directions, forming expanding circular clumps. Over time, the growing clumps, or clones, merge into a continuous and very dense meadow. By the mid eight, uh, sorry, by the mid 1980s, the staff of the Willapa National Wildlife Refuge were convinced that Spartina was a serious problem and action was necessary. But refuge staff ran into skepticism in the 1980s, some of it from state agency staff, some of it from academics here at the University of Washington, and some of it from environmentalists. In 1988, the refuge hired local botanist Kathleen Sace to document the impacts of Spartina on Willapa Bay. She determined that Spartina had probably arrived in the late 1800s. As you've seen, many of the exotics came at the turn of the century. It was commonly used at that time as packing material in ships that brought goods into Willapa Bay, as well as in rail cars that brought oyster shell from the East Coast. It was kind of the bubble wrap of the turn of the century. Kathleen also uncovered refuge records from the 1950s showing that local oyster growers talked about Spartina as a potential problem even then. Kathleen's report concluded that Spartina did pose a serious threat to Willapa Bay. And the following year in 1990, the county commissioners in Pacific County issued an emergency declaration calling for immediate action. But our rules, our environmental rules in those days were really not geared for fast response. And it took a full five years before the control program really got underway. And by that time, this was 1995, the Washington legislature had also enacted emergency declaration directing the agencies to get organized, get moving, and get aggressive. Willapa Spartina came from the East Coast populations, but as you can see in these pictures, it sure doesn't look like it. These photos show the difference, the great difference in vigor. The absence of natural enemies may explain this difference. The East Coast Spartina, shown on the right, hosts an array of native insects, while the Willapa marshes have none. The plants here in Willapa Bay can invest all of their energies in plant growth. Unfortunately, just as the eradication program began, the rate of spread of Spartina exploded. Perhaps the plant turned a corner in the adaptation process. Maybe it was that sequence of El Nino years that spurred a tipping point in fertility. For what it, whatever reason, the grass began to spread faster and faster. And you see on this map in green, you see the Spartina invasion as it exists today. Our labor-intensive and small-scale control program just could not keep up with this uh, explosive, explosive growth. Estimates describe about 2,000 acres in 1991, most of which were in the form of seedlings. By, 19, by 2002, there were over 11,000 infested acres, about half of which were in continuous dense meadows, the other half in clone fields of varying density. About half of the infestation is on public lands, 
including the Willapa National Wildlife Refuge, state aquatic lands, state heritage lands, and some oyster reserve lands. The other half of the infestation is on private lands that are broken up into hundreds and hundreds of odd-shaped parcels, many of which are highly valuable commercial shellfish beds, but some of which are tide lands with little market value. Integrated pest management is the official strategy adopted in Washington for Spartina control. It calls for the use of a variety of tools. Since the eradication program began in 1995, we have tried many, many mechanical approaches with very little success. The tools depicted here are used by the Willapa Refuge crews. This past summer, the IPM program significantly slowed the rate of spread. This summer, we expect to see a net reduction in infested acres for the first time. Large-scale operations are now possible because of the amphibious track vehicles you see in these photos. They are equipped with precision spray booms armed with infrared sensors to direct the herbicide precisely onto plants. A new herbicide called Habitat will be used for the first time this year, and we expect this herbicide to be more effective at a lower dose and with less impact to non-target species than we saw with Rodeo, the herbicide used in, pr in prior years. The goal here is total elimination of Spartina from Willapa Bay. To some, this may seem implausible given the extent of the invasion, but certain realities make it conceivable. The invasion is limited to tide lands. The area is not subject to continual reinfestation and Spartina alterniflora is easily distinguished from adjacent plants. Turning to biocontrol of Spartina, uh, it was botanist Kathleen Sace who was the first to propose biocontrol of Spartina in the late 1980s. In writing her report for the refuge, Kathleen spoke with Spartina expert Dr. Don Strong of the University of California at Davis who was interested in biocontrol of invasive Spartina in San Francisco Bay. Kathleen sent Don some seeds from Willapa Spartina plants and asked that he test the likely insects against Willapa plants. Don chose Procolisia marginata, a plant hopper native to San Francisco and common to Spartina throughout its native range. He knew them to be extremely host specific. Dr. Strong and his students were stunned by what they observed. Procolisia marginata killed Spartina from Willapa, but not Spartina from San Francisco or elsewhere. This photo shows the effect on Willapa plants. Don had visited Willapa Bay, and he knew that it lacked insects that feed on Spartina. So he suspected that Willapa plants may have lost their defenses to insects through adaptation to an environment free of insects. Willapa appeared to present a unique opportunity to use biocontrol with very low risk. The 1993 Environmental Impact Statement issued by state agencies mentioned Procolisia and the potential of biocontrol, but wrongly estimated that it would take 12 years to do the necessary R&D and acquire the permits. This discouraged any agencies with official responsibilities from seriously pursuing biocontrol. Biocontrol would not have been attempted had not a local nonprofit, the Coastal Resources Alliance, stepped forward in 1997 to make it happen. Seeing little progress in the conventional battle against Spartina, CRA raised the funding and teamed up with my center and UC Davis to begin the work in 1998. We all felt strongly that if biocontrol was not attempted, we would not be able to say that we had tried our best and we would not have tried every reasonable means to battle Spartina. More than one person said to me after I told them that I was involved with biocontrol Spartina, Bringing in an exotic to solve a problem caused by an exotic? What are you, crazy? But despite the nightmare images of biocontrol bugs gone amok, 
the track record for weed biocontrol is really quite reassuring. In 1998, Dr. Rachel McFadden, a leading Australian biocontrol expert, published the results of her worldwide survey of hundreds of weed biocontrol projects. She listed those reporting non-target impacts and determined whether they had been anticipated impacts and accepted beforehand. She found that of the hundreds of weeds biocontrol projects done, only eight were associated with non-target impacts, most of which were anticipated, and none caused significant damage. So this admirable track record is part, in part a function of the risk studies that are normally done prior to releasing a bioagent. Three key questions must be asked and answered. Will the, after we've uh, seen the Spartina gone, will the Procolisia feed on other plants? Will they reproduce on other plants? And will they spread plant diseases? Which non-target plants in Willapa Bay might be at risk if Procolisia goes sideways on us is a key question. At-risk plants include those that are closely related to the known host, those that are structurally similar to the known host, those that grow close to the known host, and you would also want to check any plants that are commercially valuable in the area. A, a quarantine greenhouse was not needed in our case because all of our host range tests were conducted within the native range of our candidate insect, Procolisia, that is at the Bodega Marine Lab run by UC Davis. And during the test, you do starvation trials in which Procolisia are put in cages with the non-target test plant only. And then in preference trials, you include a variety of non-target plants and the known host in cages and see where the insects feed and where they reproduce. In our case, Procolisia did not survive on any non-target hosts, nor could it re reproduce in them. We also looked into whether Willapa spartina was killed by a plant disease in the greenhouse trials, and the results showed that it was not. Our team completed the work and had the permits in hand within two years, two and a half years. Peer re review was the, uh, the first step in gaining the permits, an expert group, a technical advisory group was convened by USDA. You see a photo of here of them uh, coming to visit us in Willapa Bay. The TAG unanimously voted to support release of Procolisia against Spartina. For the first time in history, uh, they voted unanimously on a, a petition. In 2000, I hired Dr. Fritzi Grevstadt to serve as our lead scientist. Each spring, she rears hundreds of thousands of Procolisia in our greenhouse in Long Beach and releases them into the bay. We've seen visible signs of stress, declines in seed production, decreased height and weight. We've also seen rapid reproduction in the summer, but poor mort uh, overwinter mortality. To realize its value, biocontrol R&D should be started early and funded sufficiently to allow exploration of many agents all at once. More often than not, biocontrol takes time. But if we fail to reach the goal of eliminating Spartina, we still may benefit from the presence of Procolisia as a cost-free means to reduce the vigor of remaining Spartina. And history tells us to keep looking for safe bioagents. The graph on the top right shows that the more different agents released, the more likely success will be achieved. Mass diebacks are seen in various places. The photo in the lower right uh, shows a dieback that occurred in Louisiana, which suddenly killed more Spartina than there is in Willapa Bay. Here's another photo of a dieback that occurred in Georgia last year. We need to form ties with East Coast scientists who are studying these events. Maybe that we can learn how it can be done. If you'd like more information, I invite you to uh, visit our website. Keyword, if you Google Spartina, you, it will take you right there. Thank you. Finally, a glimmer of hope. Thank you very much. Our last speaker in, in uh, this afternoon's session is Brad White. He's the 
pest control program manager for the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and that is the agency in the state of Washington responsible for addressing invasive species issues. He's a Washington State native and an alumnus of the uh, College of Forest Resources, has a PhD uh, in uh, forest entomology. Have you got your table set for you or what? <laughs> Brad. Yes. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the uh, access to an open mic. <clears throat> I've been invited here today to talk about the strategies that are available to public agencies for dealing with invasive species. And in order to do that, I need to give you a broad overview of the process that a public agency has to go through when it is selecting a strategy to confront an invasive pest. I'm going to do this from the standpoint of a state agency, but I think you'll find these principles, principles apply to other government agencies, state and federal. In a perfect world, the strategies that we select for dealing with an invasive species would revolve around the biology of the organism. But as a public agency, we have to balance other characteristics and have to make sure that we address issues beyond the biology. And the first thing we have to do is define an invasive species for ourselves. I appreciate Dr. Baer sharing the uh, um, clinical academic definition of a species, invasive species, but public agencies use what I would call an operational definition for an invasive species. The first one I'll share with you is from Dr. Steve Yeninick at Purdue University. And it's a little long-winded, but it goes something like this. Any newly discovered organism that grabs the attention of enough regulatory officers, scientists, <laughs> citizens, and other decision makers to get action taken. When I see if you've skipped down to my operational definition, is there federal funding associated with this critter? <laughs> the reason that last one is effective and much shorter is that if there is federal funding available for this critter, you can be assured that the previous questions were already answered. So this is the first thing that an agency has to do. It has to decide whether or not an invasive species it's run across meets this definition. And if they run across an organism that meets this definition, the agency has to go back to the drawing board and work on a very fundamental decision. And this decision has to take place within what I call the iron triangle of state agencies. This is the iron triangle that any state agency has to survive within. You have the master, you have the money, and you have the mandate. The agency cannot bend nor break this triangle. It has to survive within it. If it doesn't survive within this triangle, it withers and dies. And I don't know the last time anyone has seen a state agency wither and die. So we do a pretty good job of existing within this iron triangle. Who are the masters? That's your legislators and the public through your legislators. Those are the individuals that give us our mandate. That mandate is our authority and therefore our responsibility to deal with a certain issue. The other thing they give us with our mandate is our money, so we can go out and accomplish that mandate. Mandates cut both ways. If you have the authority to do something, you have the responsibility to do it. If you don't do something, you're just in big trouble as if you do something. So if you have a mandate, you have to exercise it. If you don't exercise it, you jeopardize your funding. Also, you have to develop something within this iron triangle that doesn't make your masters mad. Because if you go out with a really effective strategy, but it makes your master mad, you could lose either your mandate, your funding, or both. So at this point, in the state agency's decision-making process, we've recognized that we have a responsibility to do something, and we have an organism that fits our definition. The next step is to devise a strategy that allows us to survive within this iron triangle. And so how do we do that? We have to develop a strategy that is biologically effective, fiscally responsible, legally defensible, and politically palatable. Okay? Those four subjects could launch a thousand hours of lecture. But I will go ahead and give you a very brief introduction to what I mean by all four of those. What I mean by biologically effective is, is this an organism we can kill? If we can't kill it, can we put a serious hurt on it? If we can't kill it or put a serious hurt on it, then we don't have a strategy from the very beginning. Fiscally responsible. In short, 
can we afford to kill it? I can guarantee you that if I was given carte blanche, I could eliminate any organism from the state of Washington. <laughs> but as taxpayers, you'd be very poor, and the state might not be worth living in when I got done. <laughs> legally defensible. Under legally defensible, what I'm talking about here is the procedural processes we have to go through when we make decisions. When a state agency is going to take an action, it triggers the State Environmental Policy Act. If federal funding is involved, you've also triggered the National Environmental Policy Act. Those are processes that force agencies to go through, gather information so the decisions they make are informed. Uh, WSDA also has to follow the integrated pest management principles that we have in state law. And in some cases, we have to follow the Clean Water Act. So there's a number of issues that have to be covered procedurally. We also occasionally have to go to our attorneys and ask if a problem is in our mandate. We have to get an opinion as to whether or not something we want to take on is in fact our responsibility. Politically palatable. This is another thing that we have to devise with our strategies. We have to have a strategy that when a legislature asks this question, can I, as an elected official, survive what this agency is proposing to do in the backyards of my constituents. So we have to come up with something that our masters, in a sense, can live with. And this may seem terribly cynical, but it's not. If we have something that we are proposing to do, and we can't adequately explain it to the legislators and also their constituents, then there's a good chance we probably have no business doing it. So politically palatable is not cynical. It's an important step. OK, so we've identified the four characteristics that set the boundaries on the kind of response that we can develop to uh, engage an invasive species. And these different characteristics have different parameters, but somewhere all of these boundaries will go ahead and line up right there in the sweet spot. And that sweet spot is where an agency can develop and actually undertake an activity to control an invasive species. So if you are not familiar with the way a regulatory agency works, either by working within it or closely with one, you might not always recognize our strategies as being elegant. Okay? In a perfect world, your strategy is supposed to be a circle. But in, in reality, it ends up to be this kind of squishy trapezoidal thing right there in the middle. That's because we have to consider things other than biology when we develop a strategy. OK, you might despair at this process. But again, I wouldn't. Um, this is a great deal of weight for a state agency to lift. When we have to go through this process, it's not simple. It's very painful. And that ensures that when we go out, when we start to move on something, we're very serious about it. It takes care of the minor incidents. We're not going to go after anything unless it's major. So once we recognize we have an invasive species and we've developed a strategy that allows us to survive within the Iron Triangle, what strategies are available to us? We have three primary strategies, containment, suppression, and eradication. These are fairly self-explanatory. These types of reactions can take place either in sequence or all at the same time, depending on the lay of the land and what the exact problem is. Now, even though I talked about the uh, four characteristics that we have to satisfy to survive as a state agency, biology carries the most weight when you're selecting one of these primary strategies. Containment is a situation where you have an organism that you can't afford to kill, but you can keep it in place. There's a lot of value to that. Suppression is a situation where you can't afford to kill it or contain it, but you can slow it down. And again, there's a lot of value in that. And eradication, my personal favorite, is when you can afford to kill it and you have the resources to do it and you get it done. Well, biology oftentimes dictates which one of these strategies you pick. The second 
influence on picking one of these primary strategies is whether the introduction is recent or resident. What I mean by this is how long has the critter been here? Himalayan blackberry is an invasive species. Are we going to eradicate it? No. I don't think we could afford it, and we've all grown used to it. Japanese knotweed, recent introduction to the Pacific Northwest. Can we eradicate it? Maybe. And the legislature would like us to try and has provided us with the mandate and the money to do so. So we'll be launching some pilot work in southwest Washington to try to eradicate Japanese knotweed from certain river systems. And that's because we think we can actually do it. If it uh, is left to its own devices for a long period of time, becomes resident, then it's another, another story. There are many other examples of this, but I'm going to skip most of them. So I'd like to talk about three of our programs that uh, illustrate these concepts. One of them is Gypsy Moth. Gypsy Moth is an elegant and efficient program that the Washington State Department of Agriculture has. Gypsy Moth is established in uh, 19 states in the eastern U.S. It is not resident to Washington State. It's introduced on a yearly basis by human activity. But we have a very effective trap and lure set up. We have a very effective monitoring program. We can detect introductions of this insect probably within one or two years of its showing up in Washington State. That's because we understand the biology and we can manipulate it. We also have a very low impact biological insecticide that we can confront this insect with, and it's very, very effective. We save probably somewhere between 30 and $35 million a year by spending a million dollars a year to keep this critter out. Nice, low impact, and elegant. Citrus longhorn beetle. Unfortunately, this insect, even though it was a very recent introduction, does not have a terribly elegant solution. Because of its biology, the only way you can get rid of this insect is to destroy it when it's in its larval stage inside of the tree. And the way you do this is remove the tree and grind it up. We understand the damage this insect can do based on our experiences in New York and Chicago with a very similar insect, the Asian longhorn beetle. So when this insect showed up in Tukwila, we took action within one calendar year, sub-calendar year, to eradicate whatever larvae were resident from the invading population. So it wasn't pretty, but it was, in our, so far appears to be very effective. Two years of survey have showed up negative data, looking at uh, over 57,000 trees in that area. This could only be accomplished if you catch something soon. So we had time on our side on that one. Uh, sudden oak death. Uh, this was a wildland problem that was isolated to about 12 counties in California and regulated as such. Somewhere in the past one or two years, this organism moved into the California nursery industry. And then nurseries do what nurseries do. They shipped it across the US. Washington State did receive infested shipments of nursery stock that had sudden oak death on it. We're in a period of containment right now. This is a very new and early invasive species, as far as Washington is concerned. And at this point in time, we're not sure what we're going to do with it. We don't have enough information yet. What we can do is contain it, and that's what we're working on. Meantime, there's a national survey going on that's trying to uh, determine how far this problem is spread. Washington is participating in that national survey. I was asked for, to provide a pithy conclusion. Uh, first of all, somebody wanted to know if the problem's going to go away. No, it's not. Uh, you notice I did not include exclusion under my strategies, uh, primarily because exclusion is not as sexy as the other three. And uh, secondarily, it doesn't work. Exclusion will reduce the incidence of invasive species introductions, but it won't stop them. There's critters out there that find holes in our regulatory framework all the time, and those are the ones we end up dealing with. Citrus longhorn beetle, sudden oak death, emerald ash borer. Eventually something gets through, and when something gets through, you have to have depth of field to deal with that problem. 
And what I mean by depth of field is that state agencies have to have the flexibility, the commitment, and the resources to confront these invasive organisms when they show up. Sooner the better. What do I mean by flexibility? I mean, do we have the tools available? Somebody mentioned we're not research and development. That's correct. Are people providing us with the tools that we can do the job with? Do we have the regulatory flexibility to get the job done? If our hands are tied by regulatory hurdles to the point that we can't get the job done in a timely fashion, we'll end up with invasive species establishing. And the resources. State agencies always need money. We never have enough money. Ask the federal people here. We're always asking for money. It's part of my job. All right. I would like to finally conclude by answering Bob Edmonds' question of when does an invasive species become established? An invasive species becomes established when the costs of eradicating that invasive species are greater than society is willing to bear. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brad. <clears throat> and that uh, concludes our afternoon session. Uh, again, please join me in thanking our three speakers.